Welcome to this special segment of the Rutledge Perspective called the Founders Intensive. In these segments, I interview amazing entrepreneurs and we talk about their stories of how they have started their businesses, why they have started their businesses, and what the journey has been along the way for them. And today, my amazing guest on the show is Candace Tolbert. And Candace is the executive director of Super Seeds. And while she's the director of this business that she started, this foundation, this nonprofit, which is different than your for-profit businesses, and we're going to talk about some of those differences, she's also currently, at the same time, running her Assist Financial Group, LLC, which she's actually been running for 20 years. So completely different businesses, one for-profit, one nonprofit, doing all the things, and got kids she's got to deal with. Candace, welcome to the Founders Intensive. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be a part. I, I am so excited to have this conversation because, you know, it is not always easy, one, to start a business in the first place. But then when you talk about at least what you're doing too, two businesses and two mm -hmm. very distinct businesses, right? So right. I told people a little bit about you're doing this financial stuff. You're doing this Super Seeds Foundation, and we're going to talk about what Super Seeds is first. But before we dive into that, talk a little bit about who you are. Who is Candace Tolbert? So years ago, I used to work for Duke Energy, um, and I worked there for seven years. And my husband and I wanted to do some investing. And so I picked up the phone one day, and I called this guy in Brentwood, Ohio, and I said, look, I want to do some investing, but here's the thing. I need you to teach me. Um, I don't want you just taking my money. And he says, I am not the person for you. Um, he referred me to a guy in Waynesville, Ohio. Um, mm -hmm. His name is Dennis Thayer, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. But I went out to meet with Dennis and he saw a young couple, didn't have a lot of debt, um, wanted to learn about investing. Mm -hmm. And he kept trying to just say, sign on the dotted line. I'll take your money and I'll put it in this account. I'll, I'll manage everything for you. And I kept asking questions. Um, yes. And so finally, after about an hour of me asking questions, um, I finally say to him, because he's Caucasian, yes. um, and I said to him, well, how do I know that you're not showing me this because I'm Black? Show me the white people plan. And he turned red as an apple. He slammed his fist on the desk and said, okay, I'll teach you. Um, but that man taught wow. me everything. And I think I came in at the right point in time in his life mm -hmm. where he was willing to pour out. And yes. so for all the things that he was teaching me about money and investing and operating a business, I knew it was not in our community, which was yes. birthed from this point, Assist Financial. I mm -hmm. wanted to help other business owners to understand when you create this LLCs, what it will do for you tax-wise, how yes. to be able to write off things legitimately. We ain't mm -hmm. talking about doing nothing illegal but how yes. to write off things that you're normally spending money on and transition it into a, a legitimate deduction for your LLC. So using, for example, everybody walking around with one of these, do not know how to properly record this so that it's on your tax as a deduction, right? Yes. So if it's under your personal name, the IRS says you can't do it. We need to transition, right. make this an asset to the yes. LLC. And so um, that's how I started this, this financial group. I started it out of my home, um, three boys raising them and just got a couple of clients and just kept getting referred to 20 years later. I built my own office. I have six employees um, and we're serving wow. in the community. We are our platform and baseline is education. So if you walk in the door, then be prepared to learn um, oh. because our job is to help educate our business owners and watch them go from a daycare center that was in home to now one of my um, daycare centers owns mm -hmm. three centers because yes. I helped her understand business and finance. See, I love this. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, we, we talk about starting businesses and mm -hmm. we talk about helping our communities and we talk about how we build generational wealth. And yes. I promise y'all we're going to get to super seeds because it is so important for y'all to understand what super seeds is. But when you talk about building up your clients and helping them learn and building their businesses, you're starting at the foundation. 
So what is it for you that says, hey, if you're really talking about building a business, let me talk to you about what that means to be financially stable if you're really talking about building a business. Right. So I walk them through the entire step. So I take them from having the idea of wanting Mm -hmm. to start their own business all the way to in fruition. Um, Mm -hmm. You talk about generational wealth. So I went through the Goldman Sachs program a couple of years ago. And one of the yes. first questions they ask is, what's your end game? Mm-hmm. And for me to think about the transition of the generational wealth piece, now I throw that out in front of my clients. You know, what is, it that, what is it your purpose? You know, what is it the legacy you want to leave behind? Because we got to move with that in mind and making yes. sure everything is set up. And I get so many business owners who have not thought about that piece, um, even from being a married couple and the husband, this is his business and my name is not on it. Well, what happens if something happens to him and he got $10,000 in the account and you can't get to it? So now you have to go to probate because he never thought about having to leave and transition his business over to his spouse. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, those are things that we try to help our business owners really understand um, all of the dynamics, even like you mentioned credit. You know, because mm-hmm. so many people come in and they want the business credit, but they don't understand mm-hmm. we got to get this personal credit together first. That part. And <laughs> yeah, we got to get that together first. Um, yes. And it's going to take, they're going to do an inquiry on your first, your personal credit mm-hmm. in order to establish anything for your business credit. And in mm-hmm. some cases, they're going to make you personally guarantee it. So are you willing to bet on yourself? Yes. 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 To do that. <laughs> You know, and, and, and that's the thing, you know, it is, it is one of the things that some of my early coaches said, because y'all look, get a coach, right? Get it, find somebody. Mm -hmm. As you heard Candace say, she wanted to learn and she did not leave the office of that man until he said, I will teach you, right? Mm -hmm. Be humble enough to know what you don't know. And to know there's probably things you don't know, you don't know. And ask somebody, ask Mm -hmm. somebody now be discerning. Because not everybody's got your best interest, but be discerning. But also understand that we all start somewhere. And when you get ready to start a business, all that stuff, all that head trash, all that I can't, I won't, I'm not worthy, I'm not willing, I don't know Mm -hmm. how, all that stuff is going to come up. I'm in year seven of my business. I am now at the final frontier, y'all, because sales is the bane of my existence. Mm-hmm. I hate sleazy salespeople. And what I have real seven years, it hit me in year seven. Laurel, yeah. seven years in, you have yet to globally announce that you're in business mm-hmm. and that you actually want people to do business with you right. on a consistent basis because you hate <laughs> to be sold to and you don't want to be that sleazy salesperson. Craziest thing yep. I've ever seen. Right. <laughs> so, yep. so just be ready. So, so yeah. for you. You know, and 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 I want to, this is kind of leading into the supersedes piece, which is as you started this business and you started taking on clients and you decided, look, I really want you to set things up the right way. We, If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. Correct. What were the things that you decided, here's what we're not going to do if we're going to do this business? What were the your absolute non-negotiables? One thing I wasn't going to do is do it all myself. And that's one of the biggest things that I see um, a business fail because they're trying to do the sales and marketing. They're trying to do the accounting. They're trying to do the taxes and what they don't understand, even the legal work. These people go and they're, this is their profession. They're staying on top of it. I do continuing education every single year to stay on top of tax laws. Unless you're sitting in the class next to me, then you need to really be hiring me to get my knowledge that I'm sitting in the room to get to be able to transfer that over to you. So I try to get over to business owners. Don't try to do it all Mm -hmm. because you can win when you focus on what you do best and then allow someone else to support the business. They ain't taking over. One of the things I tell clients all the time, I might be reading your numbers Mm -hmm. and managing the finances as far as reporting that back to you, but I'm not running your business. So you, you need to be educated on what things you're doing out there when you're standing at the counter, what yes. card are you pulling out and are you pulling it out properly? Because yes. maybe you want to run it through the business because money's there, but that's not the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. So. Oh, I love that because we don't, 
I think it was Oprah that said, right, you always need to sign your own checks, right? Mm -hmm. And what Absolutely. I love about what you said is just because someone is assisting you in your business doesn't mean they're running your business. Right. One of the things I tell my clients all the time, one of the five biggest mistakes to avoid is abdicating instead of delegating. Absolutely. You are delegating your financial mm -hmm. responsibilities to Candace. You Absolutely. are not abdicating the financial responsibility of your business to Candace. She doesn't mm -hmm. own your financial responsibility, right. but she is assisting you in ensuring you are getting where you want to be from a financial perspective. Right. And, and, to, and to utilize the service. So I have yes. the monthly bookkeeping that I do for my clients. I tell them the engagement as much as you want it to be. So yes. if I'm giving you a profit and loss statement and you never come in and ask me about what these numbers mean, my assumption is that you understand. However, I have clients to say every month, I need to go over these numbers. I need to see. And if yep. you're doing it that way and you're intentional about understanding what's happening with your business, you can actually ward off train wrecks yes. down the road. So a yes. lot of my trucking companies, we could see early on when their profit was dwindling because the cost of gas was going up, but the load yes. cost was staying the same. And so these are things that we can help business owners be able to see. Same thing for our restaurant owners. When the cost of food start going up and their prices are staying the same and you look in and now you didn't serve the community, you lost three grand last month. You yes. fed people last month because you're not paying attention to the trend. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we as business owners have to make those hard decisions yes. about raising costs and doing things differently for sustainability yes. because the service that yes. you provide, our community needs it. You know, yes. people, they want to support black businesses, but you got to know how to manage your business. And the insight is in the information, y'all. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to look at your numbers. And sometimes it's hard. We all got money stories. We've all mm -hmm. got money stories. I mean, I think Candace is one of those unicorns, right? There are a few people who just love to look at the money, right? <laughs> but some of us have money issues. And it's not right. necessarily that we're afraid of money at all. Right. But it's just there's just money stuff. We all have money stories. Mm -hmm. But find a way to keep looking at your money because early warning means early Absolutely. prepared. Right. You can Absolutely. respond when you're surprised. You get set on your heels and it's hard to respond when you're surprised. Right. Right. So and we can do those tips. You know, we have yes. business owners that come in and maybe that the, what they're paying their employees because they want to compete with Walmart in different places. They don't realize the overtime that they're paying. Yes. And, and if you hire just one additional person and put them on a different shift, now you don't have to pay overtime. And now you actually save money by bringing on additional staff member. But sometimes they can't see that in those right. numbers. They're just looking at the work that needs to be done. And I got somebody here willing to work 12 hours a day. But that might not be the brightest idea. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Bring them mm, in. Honey, so those numbers matter. They matter. That's what I tell my clients all the time. A good people strategy has to be based on a good, sound business strategy. Mm -hmm. Mission first, people always. I know everybody likes to say, but they're, but they're good. They'll show up. I really like them. They're kind. They're nice. They have a great attitude. That is wonderful. Right. And if the business isn't making any money, nobody's got a job. Absolutely. So they can be nice and all y'all will be unemployed. Absolutely. So sometimes you have to make really tough decisions, or maybe if you got the insight early, mm -hmm. it still may be a tough decision, but maybe it's not the toughest decision you have to make, right? right? You can make earlier decisions that are not as hard or not as devastating on the business because you prepared, you've prepared. Right. So, mm -hmm. so Candace, you know, you're running this incredible business. You are helping the community. You're getting people to be really mindful educated, prepared business owners that are positively impacting their community by creating jobs, creating stable businesses, creating yeah. financial stability and wealth for their families. And now Super Seeds happens. Yes. Now I know it didn't happen like that. Right. And tell us, <laughs> tell us, tell everybody who's listening how Super Seeds happened. So um, Super Seeds happened. So let me say this. So my husband um, is a minister. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do a lot of ministry work. And so one of the things we've always been supportive of is teachers. Mm -hmm. So anytime the teacher would call and say, my son was talking in class, 
I don't care what he said when he got home, you were talking in class and we're going to deal with this because these teachers got too much on their plates. Yes. Um, until one day I got a phone call stating that my son stared at a girl staring and it was an immediate suspension out of school. Hold up. Wait a minute. My child has never had another altercation with another student, never had a detention, never had an in-school suspension. And here a staring incident is causing an out-of-school suspension immediately. So as a parent, my question was, did he do any motion of evil while he stared at her? No, he didn't. What was her response when he was staring at her? She was laughing and giggling. Did she ever say stop? And he continued. She did say stop and he immediately stopped. So my face is looking like yours. So what, where's the infraction? Where's the lesson here? Right. That you skipped over a demerit, an in-school suspension, a detention, and went straight to an out-of-school suspension. Um, and so it was at a Catholic school and there was no appeal process. So he served the out-of-school suspension and then we went in to have a conversation. And the only thing I wanted the school to do was back off, just say, hey, we yes. made a mistake, we overreached, um, we're gonna take this off of his record. Right. The school refused to do that. Um, and so if you Google suspended for staring, you will see the story just went international. Wow. We had the Julia Morning Show, uh, Joe Madison was advocating for my son mm -hmm. on his radio show, having parents call in. Um, mm -hmm. We went to court. And the only thing mm -hmm. I was asking the court to do was to remove that suspension off of his record. Because as right. I was going through this case, parents all over the country were reaching out to me on Facebook and sending me notes about, well, my daughter was suspended for 10 days for bringing a nail clip to school. They accused her of bringing a weapon. Um, my son is being suspended for his shirt being untucked, but in fact, the shirt is just too short and wouldn't stand. Mm. And so when you look at the numbers, statistics mm -hmm. for the state of Ohio, over 200,000 kids are suspended out of school. Mm -hmm. And when you break the reasons down for truancy, weapons, mm -hmm. gun charges, or drugs, the highest category of out of school suspensions is disobedient, disruptive behavior, mm -hmm. which is highly subjective. Like yes. who's monitoring this category? And when you break it down by race, African-American children are being displaced out of the school. So they're saying you can't be seated, you can't learn in the building. Right. And so that is what birth supersedes. As I was going through it, um, and I'm a praying woman, it's like, yes. Lord, what is it that you're asking me to do? This is so crazy. Why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. And the reason was, I need you to go out and advocate for these kids. Yes. To be that, that, that intervention for them. Mm -hmm. To be that voice for them when they really didn't do it. And, yes. and to protect them, protect their seat in that classroom. And so that's how Superseas was birthed as a mission of originally to um, be an alternative to out of school suspensions. Mm -hmm. I love and, that. Yeah. I love that. And so as you began to build this, this secondary business that is really a purpose driven mm -hmm. social enterprise, right? To make, mm -hmm. make an impact on the community as well, just in a mm -hmm. different manner. Did you use kind of the same thought process to build it and the same structure to build it? Or did it come from a totally different place to get it set up? It came from a totally different place and it was merely driven by the need and the motion to do it. So mm -hmm. I actually, to start Super Seas, I went to three of the local schools here mm -hmm. and I offered my program as an alternative to suspension program. They okay. weren't offering any money. So I was actually picking these kids up that were going to be suspended, mm -hmm. written bands, paying people to drive them on these, these transformation camps, mm -hmm. paying for their meals, but I needed the outcomes. So yes. there was a lot of sweat and financial equity because it was, as a new nonprofit, people don't know what they're investing in yet. They need right. numbers, they need some data. And so it was a, a total different platform. And mm -hmm. so for me, because I had a cis financial group, I could take the funds and bring it over here to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, as I began to build momentum and had numbers and data to show, mm -hmm. then I was able to apply for grants to be able to help me in this work. Mm -hmm. So this is going to sound like a really just philosophical question, but how did you 
get your mind wrapped around. This is something that I know has to be done because I see what this is doing to our black and brown children. Right. And I have to put my data hat on. Mm -hmm. I can't just leave this with my heart. It's what I tell my, my, my women founders all the time. I need you to keep leading with your heart, but I need you to act with your head. Mm -hmm. How did you marry this thing happened to my kid? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Like my heart is hurting. I'm ready to fight some folks behind my right. child, but I've got to get data because the fight is about playing chess, not checkers. And I've right. got to, I got to dig deep and figure out what data, how to get the data. Like, how did you, how did you marry and, and manage the need to get real strategic with mm -hmm. the emotion of this is a social enterprise that's going to make a bigger impact but I got to go slow to go fast here. How, how, how did you do that? So uh, emotional, the emotion drove it first, especially okay. when I looked at the data. So mm -hmm. um, when I looked at the fact that eight year olds and 10 year olds and 12 year olds having a fight in school are now being arrested in handcuffs, they're coming out in handcuffs, which I is can't. ludicrous to me, right? Exactly. So for me, it was about, hold up, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. If a child has a fight, and you arrest them and you put them in the system and start this pattern, what is it really teaching them? Why aren't we teaching them conflict resolution, anger management, de-escalation, and so that they can understand how to integrate themselves back into the community? Mm -hmm. What I looked at was from a judicial standpoint, there is no financial really um, incentive mm -hmm. for them to stop the behaviors in our community because they see us as dollar signs, Yes, right? So they, they're grabbing them earlier. So the emotion was the real part to drive it. Now for mm -hmm. the data, I had to work with my resources. So mm -hmm. when I worked in Lachlan, I worked very closely with them and I, they know I needed data. Yeah. And so they tracked numbers. What they mm -hmm. found in Lachlan when I first started, they had 1,500 youth that was referred from the classroom to the principal's office for discipline. Okay. What we did is looked at three areas. We looked at educating the educator, Right, mm -hmm. looking at their own social biases, giving right. them a tool for being proactive, which was supersede, so they yes. can ward off situations before they happen. Mm -hmm. The second was educating parents. We needed yes. parents to come to the table. As angry as I was mm -hmm. for them suspending my son and wanting to tear up the school, I knew right. that wasn't the right course to mm -hmm. take. So yes. I need parents, though, to be willing to hold their child accountable. Yes. In my situation, I would have held him accountable if they would have said to me that he, um, when he stared at her, he balled up his fist and frowned like he was going to hurt her. Right. End of story. It wouldn't. It probably wouldn't even be a supersede today. Right. <laughs> right. I wanted to hold him accountable, but yes. they didn't give me a basis for it. So I need parents right. to look at the fact that their child has a fight. It's not enough to say, "Well, they hit my kid first and he was defending himself." No, they're getting arrested for fighting. We got to right. find another way. Hold them yes. accountable. Mm -hmm. The third thing was taking the kids through, and I needed the kids to be able to look at that school to prison project. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be strategic. You can't take these kids yes. into a room and show them a seminar. What right. I actually did is I took them to the jail. I needed them yes. to see it and smell it, but not from a scare straight component. I need right. them to understand that if you want to feed the system with behaviors, mm -hmm. look at all the people who are monetarily benefiting off of the system. Yes. Yeah, they're buying cars. They're buying real estate. They're getting health insurance. They're sending their kids off to college based on the fact that you don't want to change your behavior. So now that you understand the system, I throw it back in the kids. Like, what are you going to do about it? So oh. when I started with Lachlan and we started these three pillars of education, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. first year, fifteen hundred referrals from the principal's office to the from the classroom to the principal's mm -hmm. office. Mm -hmm. Two years later. We ended the year with a hundred referrals. See, that just brings tears to my eyes. A That's hundred. amazing. Amazing. And so what they found was teachers could back off the discipline. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, they didn't even have to get involved because once the, the youth understood the real life consequences, yes. they intervened. Yes. So that peer to peer is, is, is very That's strong. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's more stronger than anything we could ever say. Right. But if a 13 year old get in the face of another 13 year old and say, come on, it ain't even worth the fight. Let's turn yes. around and go to something else. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. That's what they found. So we started doing the work at Lachlan um, and then juvenile court heard about the work we were doing. Mm -hmm. So now we do a lot of work for juvenile court. So kids that are arrested for the first or second time, they go through my program. Again, numbers don't lie. 72% of the kids that go through the transformation camp from the first time they're arrested, Mm -hmm. post one year, two years, and we going on three, have not returned for additional court cases. See, that's what we talk about when we are trying to end recidivism, honey. That's it. Yes. So we Mm. need super programs, not just in Cincinnati, but we need them all over the country because if we can also bridge that relationship between our youth and law enforcement to understand what their role is, respect their role in the community, that in itself will modify and change behavior. So when I take the kids and we sit in arraignment court, and they can see the disparity from the judge that's sitting on the bench where the one guy come in is African-American with the nappy hair and he, he got to go. He don't get a bond. Right. 10,000 straight. The other Caucasian come in with the blonde hair. Yes. He didn't been arrested three times, but we're going to let him out on the OR bond. And the yes. kids are sitting there going, they did the same thing. Exactly. And so I try to get our kids to understand if we're ever going to bring equity to the system, we got to get in the system. And you being suspended from school and fighting out into the community is not the way to do it. No. No. I need you to aspire to be the prosecutor, aspire to be the judge, to bring equity to the system. And that way, if you're doing it, then we know it's equitable because you've seen it, you've experienced it. Yes. Yeah, look, (laughs) y'all, let me tell you something. You are listening to an innovator. This is what we call innovation, right? Someone who truly saw a problem and developed an innovative solution based on data that has real proven outcomes, right? That's what real innovators do. That's what real innovators do. And so as we, because I know I could talk to you for for 45 minutes, 55 minutes, four days. But as, as we wrap this up, I got a couple, couple more questions. So if you think about supersedes in its totality, what you have done, this idea of taking, taking emotion and bottling that emotion and moving it into action, that is data-based action that at least helps prevent, if not eliminate, right? The opportunity for biased response. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to those who are seeking to tackle a really hard idea or situation, one that is fraught with these very inherent long-term biases in it? What advice would you give to them as they try to start to come up with a solution to attack one of those things effectively. So looking at the end goal, what the solution. So where is it that you're trying to aspire to? I started off with this angry motion of trying to fight a system and advocate for our youth. But at the end of it, I needed our youth seated in the classroom. I needed them academically focused. I needed them to have the hope that regardless of what circumstance brought me to this place, I'm still of value. So many of our kids come in when they've been arrested and they've been suspended for five or six times, they emotionally beat down. So we have to kind of build them up. And so what I would recommend to anybody, where are you trying to get them to? And then you have to drive it there. So when our kids go through the Super C's program, from the day that I open up, the time I open up my mouth, it's about building them up to help them yes. understand you still have value. You still have work. You still have freedom. That means you have choices. Yes. And so whatever it takes to get you to the next phase, and it can be just as simple as graduating from high school. Mm-hmm. We talk about that. When you walk across that stage and all the people are cheering, you get to own that moment. That's your yes. moment. You did that work. Your mama yes. might've been fussing at you about doing the homework, but you had to do the homework and turn it yes. in and sit in the classroom and take the test. So we break it down that simple. Even if we have to go to the ninth grade, the 10th grade, 11th grade to get to the graduation, what do we need to do? And so one of the things Super C found is that we need to collaborate. Mm -hmm. There's no need for me 
to create an after school program when there are other black led successful organizations yes. already doing it. We need to work yes. together and not compete against one another. So looking at what you're trying to offer and where you're trying to get them to, again, the vision could be yours. Supersees is not me. It's a village of people working yes. together to try to bring the end result. So I've learned to collaborate with organizations like Ladies of Leadership, mm -hmm. I Dream Academy, um, Build Your Own Dream to teach kids about tech or uh, construction field. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it all, but I'm a partner because the end goal yes. is that these kids have the hope and awareness and the courage. To become. I'm just trying to plant like seeds. And so like um, anybody that's in this work, look at what you're trying to get them in, and that'll drive your day. That'll drive I love it. I love it. It's not about competition. It's about collaboration. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And then I guess the final question that I would ask you, because you are in rare air, you have one business that's been around 20 years. I mean, truly rare air. There is so much fade in entrepreneurship. Very few businesses make it past five years and you are going 20 and could go 20, 30 more if you chose to. And now you've started another one, right? And started it from scratch. Mm -hmm. What are the one max three things that you would tell a CEO that she needs to have if she is going to be in it for the long haul as an entrepreneur? Um, number one is the mindset that you are serving. Mm. You are serving and you're providing a service that the, the community needs. Mm -hmm. um, so I tell people all the time, I might be self-employed, but I got a whole bunch of bosses. <laughs> so that, that's one, um, is to understand your purpose and your role and where you fit and what you're offering, whether it's a for-profit or not. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, for the long haul, you gotta, again, understand those numbers. You gotta bring the people around you that can support you. Mm -hmm. So once you understand your role, then you understand that you need to bring other people around to support that journey, whatever it might be, to be able to do that. Um, and then I think the third one is you got to have that balance mm -hmm. for the long haul. When I first started doing taxes, um, it's so easy to work 12 hours a day yes. because you got so many people coming in. And I, when having three kids at home, um, when I moved up the business out of my home, my husband said, you need to have a cutoff time. And I'm like, how do I have a cutoff time? <laughs> I need to work to five or six o'clock. Right. But I'm thankful that he did that. So my hours pretty much were nine to three. I had to make it work. Yeah. Because you, you got to have that balance because you'll look back over your life if you have kids and family. And even though you brought money into the household, where were you? Yes. You were absent. And so that's going to be real important just for the sustainability of you and for your family is to have that balance. I love that. I love that. Well, Candace, I tell you what, we're just going to have to do this again because there's so much more that I think we can dig into uh, in entrepreneurship, in data, because I love me some data and giving you information <laughs> that gives you insight into the decisions that you're trying to make. And just this, this beautiful thing that you're doing to help kids who are easily, easily being pushed aside just mm -hmm. because, because they're right. easy targets. And mm -hmm. you stood up and said, no, not just my child, not just not my child, but not anybody else's child either. And Absolutely. there is such beauty and grace and love in that action. And so I, for one, thank you for that because mm -hmm. our kids need that. And thank you for being a part of the Founders Intensive brought to you by The Rutledge Perspective. And I know we are gonna do it again. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. If it said something to you, please hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. And you can find more of my video content here. Thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.